With the government in chaos, welcome to Tisky Sour. I'm Barnaby Rain, standing in for Michael Walker, and I'm joined tonight for a very special show by Dahlia Gabriel. Dahlia, welcome. Hi. Get well soon, Michael. I didn't realize that you were ill until today, but we will carry the torch in your honor and really give it to the, the British state today. Michael has chosen to get COVID during a day of very slow news, uh, so we won't be having much to report on today. I'll be joined by Aaron Bastani later as well. Now let's get to it. The cabinet in rebellion, resignations from all sides, and tonight, reports of tears in Downing Street as ministers just promoted now beg the prime minister to resign. Big Dog has lost his bark. The Tory party watched him face a pandemic with one of the worst death rates in Europe and the worst economic effect in the G7, with millions of pounds handed over to his friends in corrupt contracts never delivered while people died, and they did nothing. They watched him force low-paid workers to clean up his illegal Downing Street parties during a pandemic, and they did nothing. When he was accused of trying to funnel taxpayers' cash to his lovers, they did nothing. When he tried to get Parliament to protect Owen Paterson, his corrupt MP mate, they did nothing. When he and Rishi Sunak took £20 a week off the poorest people in Britain, while energy profits soared and their friends pocketed corrupt cash, Tory MPs went along with it all. When his government sought to end the right of most refugees to claim asylum in Britain, craven, racist Tory MPs voted for it. Now, finally, the wheels are coming off the dogmobile. Dahlia, what's been the worst thing about Boris Johnson's premiership? Wow. I mean, what a, what a question. I think that's like the most cursed game of would you rather um, I've ever played. I mean, it depends what you mean. In terms of things that can be directly traced to his ideology, to Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson's personal politics, uh, I think it has to be uh, his response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is where we really saw the, the rugged and toxic individualism, the, the utter contempt for those that he perceives to be weaker than, that, than him, i.e. working class people all across Britain, the very perverted uh, notion of civil liberties that he holds. We saw them all crystallize into this horrendous consequence, which saw, as you just said, um, the highest death toll uh, in Europe, the highest death toll from comparable economies. This is despite the fact that, you know, for all intents and purposes, Britain should have had a robust response to the COVID pandemic. You know, we have a socialized healthcare system. Uh, we have, you know, a, a very big economy. Uh, and yet through the deliberate uh, arrogance, the the decisions to flout scientific advice, uh, to go against the expertise of epidemiologists, this commitment to this incredibly individualistic idea that he has of freedom, um, where he views you know people people like him, their individual mobility as more important than the health and the ability to work and live safely of particularly those with disabilities, people with underlying conditions, that kind of um, particular strain of his ideology really came through um, with devastating consequences. Uh, in terms of his premiership as a whole, so if we're talking about his ministers, which obviously he chose as reflections of his own ideology, um, it has to be the policing bill. Uh, just because it expands the power of the police so dramatically uh, and, and really hampers our ability to, over the coming years, to organise and undo uh, some of the most devastating parts of this Conservative uh, government. So I think that expansion of carceral power uh, and the clear disregard or any form of human rights legislation, you know, with all of the flaws of human rights legislation, still the watching the loss of that as a result of things like the policing bill and the overall attitude of Preeti Patel, which was Boris Johnson's appointment into Home Secretary, uh, into the Home Office, to me, uh, the lasting effects of that on our 
political culture uh, on the most vulnerable and marginalized people in society. And particularly when those people choose to resist the state, uh, the consequences that will be meted out on them as a result of that bill. uh, To me, uh, that is the most catastrophic thing that we have seen um, over the past few years under, under Boris Johnson's government. As Dahlia says, they talk about freedom when it's the freedom to make lots of money or to go to the pub when they won't uh, quickly impose lockdowns like other countries at the start of the pandemic. They talk cheaply and easily about freedom when Boris Johnson says, let the bodies pile high. But when it comes to the people who really need it, people who suffer and who struggle having the freedom to protest, the freedom to strike, um, the freedom to defend themselves, uh, the freedom even to come to this country for a safe life. Uh, the Tory party are the enemies of freedom. I'm joined now by Aaron Bastani. Aaron, what would you say has been the single worst thing about Boris Johnson's premiership? For me, it's it's the fact that a, a different future was denied. Uh, for me, the worst thing he did was to win the 2019 general election. And I know that there are some people that might disagree with this, but for instance, I don't think that the policies he's embarked on are as injurious as what we saw, for instance, under the coalition government. That's partly because he can't do anything. He's ineffective and useless, and he hasn't got the buy-in that Cameron and and Clegg and Osborne had after 2010. But it's also partly because, of course, he won on a promise to level up, uh, and he did not win on a promise to um, reduce living standards, reduce wages, which, of course, these are all now happening. But it was a a very different political prospectus that he ran on in 2019, and, of course, won a, a significant majority on in 2019, very different to the Austerian project at the beginning of the decade. What we see with Johnson and what we see in 2019 is an exhaustion of that austerian project. And we could have had an alternative of more house building, rapid decarbonisation, high wage, high productivity economy, putting working people first, reversing the most regressive industrial um, and labour legislation in the world, a a project of re-industrialisation, green industrialisation and levelling up in a meaningful sense, taking on regional inequality. All of that All of that was taken away from the country with the victory of Boris Johnson in 2019. And the the handmaids to that weren't just the Conservative Party, but also, sadly, much of the media and, of course, elements of the Labour Party too. So for me, that's the worst thing he did. And I still think that history will judge, for instance, David Cameron as a more destructive prime minister, responsible for more um, craven acts of self-harm. Of course, he is the man as well who called at the drop of a hat. Uh, the, uh, the 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 referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union, the constitutional fate of this country was, I think, meant to be condensed and explained in, what, 13 words, something more or less like that. And he sort of, it was almost like a whimsical Sunday walk in the park. Let's just have a referendum on membership of the European Union, not put any thought into the content of that or even the campaign. And before it was uh, clear to him that the stakes for that were rather high and that they would have significant consequences, probably for the rest of our lives, it was too late. And of course, he then walked away. So that for me is the worst part of Boris Johnson, is that he represents the the craven decay of the Conservative Party and the inability of it to address any challenges of the 21st century. It simply can't do it with its commitment to free markets and the worship of money. I actually even think that we are seeing with inflation now uh, and you saw it in Rishi Sunak's resignation letter and his talk of sacrifices, um, uh, the possible return of the language of austerity and of falling living standards. So even that dreadful uh, ghost of the Cameron years isn't really gone. Dahlia, why did it take the Tory party so long to move against Boris Johnson? Well, it's interesting because, you know, you don't have a situation where two major ministers... Uh, you know, Sunak and Javid, who were kind of the first two big headline uh, resignations. You don't have a situation where two ministers wake up on, you know, a random Tuesday and coincidentally decide to both resign at the same time. Uh, And of course, the fact that Johnson is completely unfit to leave this country uh, has long been obvious. So nothing has changed in the past few days. So what's clearly happened here? is that there's been an internal decision that has been made, which is that, you know, based on information that we might not necessarily be privy to, uh, that Johnson's time is is now up. And, and short of winning a snap election, which I think is 
highly unlikely. There frankly isn't really much Johnson can actually do about it. So I think we should see these resignations not so much as the cause of Boris Johnson's downfall, but actually the symptom of the fact that the downfall is already um, underway. Because this is essentially the modus operandi of the Conservative Party. You know, this has been how it's operated um, historically. Uh, they elect whoever they can at any given time is able to reliably create uh, the political conditions that are needed to continue redistributing wealth from, you know, the poorest in society to the richest. Uh, so that person might, you know, fit into a particular cultural or social zeitgeist. So for Boris Johnson, it was he was resonating with this particularly sort of craven, horrible British nostalgia that was at its peak um, and continues to be at its peak for for Cameron, it might have been, oh, he kind of represented this glossy sort of modern tone uh, that the Tories felt that they needed in order to seem culturally and socially relevant. Um, and then once that person has sort of outrun their ability to secure those political conditions uh, for the class that they represent, um, they very swiftly and brutally um, dispose of them and move on to the next uh, person and it doesn't matter how much that person that that leader might have achieved for them, they are incredibly ruthless when it comes to going through um, their leaders. And sometimes you know those leaders go easily, uh, and sometimes they go very dip, very hardly. And I think you know they take the really difficult route, and that's what we're seeing um, Johnson is doing. So what we are seeing now is not just you know nearly one fifth of the Tory cabinet suddenly deciding that it had a conscience and waking up one day and realizing that Johnson is an unconscionable figure whose incompetence and indifference and callousness has cost so many lives in this country, but rather that a well-oiled process that has been implemented many times historically um, is simply being put into to motion. So whilst this looks very chaotic from the outside, um, to an extent it might also be chaotic on the inside, I think it's actually a very tried and tested method for ensuring basic continuity between Tory administrations. So that has what we that is what has changed rather than any objective conditions surrounding Johnson's premiership. What has changed is that internally it has been decided that now is the time uh, that someone else in the party, maybe that person hasn't been directly identified, but at least there is a view that there are other candidates within the party other than Johnson, that are now able to secure the political conditions that are necessary in order to maintain capital's interest in what is likely to be an incredibly hot summer of strikes. Um, so clearly there has been an assessment that Johnson will not be able to cope uh, in, those, in those conditions. And that, that is the cynicism, I think, with which we have to, to look at the events that have unfolded over the past 24 hours. Aaron, what does it tell us about Britain today and about the contemporary Conservative Party that until tonight, Boris Johnson was the best they could offer? Well, I don't think he was the best that they could offer. Um, I don't think in terms of governing the country, administering the state, nobody thought this man is uh, head and shoulders above somebody like Zahawi or Jeremy Hunt, who if they were in the private sector could probably be the CEO of a major company, would do an okay job. They could keep things ticking over. Boris Johnson is useless. Uh, what he could do, however, and that's the reason why he was the Prime Minister, is he does have this ability to bring together these two parts of the present Tory party coalition, which of course is unravelling at the seams, of pro-Brexit, socially conservative, more punitive immigration policy. Now, of course, that's flexible. These people aren't going to stay like that forever. They might change their minds. They might have already changed their minds. Se seats in the so-called Red Wall and more prosperous, affluent, uh, sort of evergreen Tories in the South, you know, their, their blue wall, as it's been called. Now, of course, this is all in flux. The situation is very dynamic. What he could uniquely do in 2019, that was his pitch to the membership, and rightly so, because they ended up winning a massive majority, was to be able to bring these two sides together. He had a national political brand, big name recognition. He was associated with Brexit. And people thought he can get us over the line. And this was, of course, visible in the resignation letter of Sajid Javid saying that you helped us defeat the threat of Corbynism, which it's easy to forget now, particularly with 
all the London Big House pundits poo-pooing Corbyn from their designer kitchens in Putney and Barnes. But at the time, that was a really pressing concern for them as well. So they thought he could do that. They didn't think, I think, that he would be particularly good at administering the state. However, this has still collapsed far more quickly than I think anybody thought, including ourselves. It's only a little more than a year ago that they won a surprising by-election in Hartlepool. They had outstanding local election results across the country. I think the smart money at that point would have been Tories will get a bigger majority than 2019. And if anybody was going to resign from frontline politics, it was Keir Starmer, even going into the Labour conference in... Uh, in 2021, you know, in August, September, he looked like the leader that was most vulnerable. So a lot can change quickly and a lot has changed quickly. Uh, what does it say about the Conservative Party, however, that he was elevated and that nobody else really was a, a contender? It says a great deal. And I think this does actually also pertain to whoever replaces him. People, including myself, you know, I think Ben Wallace is the most likely Tory to replace him, or it could be Penny Mordaunt. I think their best hope is staid, boring, low risk, you know, quite um, sort of authority. I don't mean authoritarian, they're all authoritarian. Boris Johnson doesn't come across as an authority figure. Uh, somebody like I say, Ben Wallace or Penny Mordaunt, of course, she was a, a naval reservist. Now, they're still going to have the same problems because the people behind them haven't changed. And it is really no coincidence that you have almost every month one story after another in terms of sexual assault, sexual harassment, watching pornography. These aren't all the same thing, by the way. You know, in defense of the people caught watching porn in the Houses of Parliament, it's not the same as, as uh, sexual assault on a minor. It's not the same as raping your wife. I'm literally talking about two conservative MPs there. And of course, there was one more alleged case of sexual assault, which, we, you know, we don't know who that MP is. They're unnamed. They may be a Labour MP, but given the complexion of all these cases so far, they're, they're probably a Tory MP. Now, that is not an accident. If you have a politics built upon the worship of money, the veneration of status and power, and you dismiss wholesale uh, basic ideas of generosity, kindness, and actual just social solidarity, and that people, regardless of what you think of them or what they earn or what they do, should never be taken for granted or stamped upon or looked upon as filth and rubbish. When you have that as your ruling ideology, you get politicians like this, just as night follows day. And so the level of personnel within the Conservative Parliamentary Party, the kinds of being people being promoted, reflect that broader problem that they have. Now, not all Conservative voters are like that. I mean, that would be a silly thing to say. You're looking at what? 15, 16 million people, I don't know, the last election that voted Tory. And of course, far more have voted Tory over the last 10 years. And maybe now they're at the Lib Dems or Labour or, or whoever. I'm not saying all lay, uh, Tory voters are like that. But what I am saying, and I'm not even saying their councillors are all like that, although you do get some funny stories, you know. Uh, a Tory councillor near where I live was putting on uh, Nazi swastikas on cupcakes uh, about one Easter ago. What I am saying, though, is the people that rise to the top of this Conservative Party in no way reflect the general general public. And to finish, this is obvious actually in the last two chancellors. I mean, wow, what a story. The fact that somebody, i.e. Boris Johnson, has maybe been asked to resign by two consecutive chancellors in, in two consecutive days. I don't know if we've actually had confirmation on Zahawi yet. Nadim Zahawi and Rishi Sunak. Now, Rishi Sunak, his personal wealth is in the tens of millions, but between him and his wife, they are worth a great deal more, hundreds of millions. Nadim Zahawi, his property portfolio with his wife is estimated at between 50 and 100 million pounds. We've gone from a guy who was obsessed with working in California and he'll probably end up in big tech to a guy who wanted the taxpayer to fund the warming of his stables. Again, not an accident. These are the kinds of people that are attracted to the Conservative Party and who succeed in the Conservative Party. Just to give you a sense of the absurdity of the current situation, our understanding is that there are now two delegations in Downing Street, in separate parts of the building. Talk TV's Kate McCann tweeted, I understand there are two different groups of MPs currently in Downing Street, the ones who want the PM gone and the ones preparing a fight back with or without PM. Nadine Doris is in the latter, so she wants the PM gone. Suggestion that Zaha so, so, sorry, she wants the PM to stay. It gets confusing, doesn't it? Uh, suggestion that Zahawi could also be lobbying for the PM to stay. Well, now we've heard uh, suggestions that actually Nadim Zahawi's in the other camp. He wants the PM to go, having just been promoted today. Um, uh, Dahlia, in a 
nuclear holocaust, would Nadine Doris be the last person in Boris Johnson's bunker? It's quite something to to watch, isn't it? And and one thing that we might see uh, in a new iteration of you know whoever takes on the reins of, of the Conservative Party after Boris Johnson is perhaps less. We might just hear a little bit less from Nadine Doris, and I think that is a reality. Uh, that I am willing to suspend all of my cynicism uh, around why this is happening now in order to just enjoy uh, the fact that that Nadine Doris might not be a permanent fixture uh, of the British political landscape. Not that it hasn't been entertaining to watch, but it has been uh, made me even more embarrassed of the British political landscape than than usual. (laughs) In a moment we will take you through the journey of how we got here and the drama of the last 24 hours. If you're new to our channel, though, you may not know that at Navara Media, we're currently running a fundraiser. We're hoping to expand our base of supporters to 10,000 people. We rely overwhelmingly on our supporters. So we're almost there, um, but let's see how we're doing. 9,400 of you have signed up to support our work, so that's amazing. Thank you so much to everyone who's signed up so far to support us. If you haven't already, head to navaramedia.com slash support and sign up to give whatever amount you can each month. Aaron, the fundraiser, it's been going well, hasn't it? It's been going very well. You know, I shared a few images earlier on today and I said the ambition is to get to 10,000 supporters, which is more or less the size of Bournemouth Stadium, the Vitality Ground, Vitality Stadium. Uh, which is about 11,500. One day will be Fratton Park, which is about 20,000. Uh, and in the distant future, maybe one day when, you know, when Barnaby is uh, the, the top dog at Navarra and I've been ousted Steve Jobs style, uh, we'll have, you know, 70,000 supporters. Uh, that will be a long way away. But I think that's the ambition we have at the organization. I think that's the ambition that our supporters have as well, because they recognize that we're not going to be able to shift much in politics in this country without a different kind of media and a different kind of media that's really, yes, of course, batting batting and punching above its weight. Of course, we're always going to have to do that, Navarro. We're not going to be the BBC or Channel 4 or the Daily Mail. But I think people recognize that we need to have serious media outlets which are covering stories, reporting stories, doing news gathering, doing opinion in a way that uh, in a way that legacy media doesn't. And if we don't have that, well, then politics won't really change. We'll be we'll be running to stand still on the left. After all that, Johnson was facing a desperate day of public appearances. This is how it started on Tuesday evening. This was Boris Johnson on live TV, apologizing to the nation for appointing sex pest Chris Pincher as deputy chief whip. To appoint Pincher, Johnson lied to his cabinet, his MPs, and then the country. The prime minister had denied that he'd ever had any knowledge of allegations of sexual harassment about Pincher. It then emerged that he had been briefed about Pincher's reputation. He went ahead with the appointment, despite knowing of allegations that this man assaulted others. Boris Johnson, unsurprisingly, didn't care very much about sexual assault. He never cares when vulnerable people are attacked by powerful people. His excuse? That he had simply forgotten being told of Pincher's reputation. That proved to be too absurd for members of his own government. Immediately following Johnson's apology, Chancellor Rishi Sunak and Health Secretary Sajid Javid both resigned, with a slew of further resignations through the evening. Any reasonable prime minister might think that now was the time to quit, But how did Johnson react to an evening of resignations? According to the Times political editor, Boris Johnson was asked by an ally tonight if he was considering quitting. He replied, fuck that. The boy who wanted to be world king clearly isn't going to let the opinions of either his MPs or the plebs knock him off course. YouGov conducted snap polling shortly after, and it is perhaps the most shocking result for any uh, prime minister in recent history. 69% of the public think that Johnson should quit, and more than half of Tory voters agree. That's compared to less than a fifth of the public, and only a third of Tory voters who say that Boris Johnson should stay. After all that, Johnson was facing a desperate day of public appearances today, with the media gathering outside Westminster to catch every moment of the high drama and living for the literal circus vibes. 
Well, it was clear that Rishi Sunak was not um, is that, uh, willing to deliver. <laughs> so where's those, that come um, from? Is that? Um, I don't know. Are we about to do karaoke? I think it must be a new Downing Street. Um, is it? Tactic. A... Get him to go away. Alex. Oh, it's oh, Steve Bray. It's, it's not the Steve latest Bray. Steve Bray protest, oh my gosh. isn't it? Come on, Steve. Um, Come well, on, Steve. I suppose if you are no longer allowed to shout, yeah. there are other ways of making your voice heard. Throughout the morning, one resignation followed another. Two education ministers, Robin Walker and Will Quince, both quit. And later, two more ministers said bye-bye to Johnson, John Glenn and Victoria Atkins. But it wasn't only ministers who were leaping from the sinking ship. Many vocal Johnson supporters from the back benches decided they'd had enough too. Johnson loyalist MP Lee Anderson published his no-confidence letter on Facebook. Here he is talking to GB News. We're at a, at a bit of a gridlock at the moment, aren't we? Things seem to be stuck in that place. Uh, I think the, the recent events, like I say, over the past week has, has pricked a lot of people's conscience. I mean, the other stuff, we, you know, like I say, there was a bit of a witch hunt. Mistakes were made. He put things right in number 10. He changed the staff. But this latest, uh, this latest debacle, if you like, is sort of the, the catalyst that, that people like me, um, you know, it, oh, it's triggered me. It's, it's, it's upset me. It's, um, you know, I want to think about it. We've got people working in that place, staffers. You know, MPs um, work with staffers, they socialise with staffers, we go to events, on, on, you know, in and around London. And these people have got to feel safe. They've got to have the confidence to know that, you know, we're on their side. And, and the events over the past, past four or five days shows that we're not always on their side. And I, I can't handle that. So, I mean, that's why I'm here today. I'm just, like I say, I'm gutted. I don't want to be stood here talking to you. A lot. I've got better things to do. So after supporting Johnson through countless failures and scandals and accusations of harassment of women by Tory MPs, it's the one involving male victims that triggers Anderson and his colleagues. How very telling. Another Johnson supporter who submitted a no-confidence letter is Tom Hunt MP. He wrote on Facebook, Events of the past week have been the straw that has broken the camel's back. In a sense, one of the worst things about the revelations at the Carlton Club last week, that's about Chris Pincher, was how unsurprising they were to many colleagues. I personally find it hard to believe that the Prime Minister wasn't aware of the extent of concerns about the former Deputy Chief Whip. I strongly believe that the situation that occurred last week could have been avoided, and I also think that the handling of it subsequently was deeply disappointing. Now, that message has been echoed in many of the no-confidence letters that have been published. The sense that MPs knew they were being lied to by the Prime Minister all along. Soon, it was time for Johnson to attend Prime Minister's questions. No doubt still in denial about the fact that it was likely to be his last. Here's what Starmer had to ask Johnson. We know who he really is. Before he was found out, he's reported to have said he's handsy. That's the problem. Pincher by name, pincher by nature. Now, has the Prime Minister ever said words to that effect? And I'm not asking for bluster and half-truth. We've all had enough of that. Yeah. Yes or no? Mr Speaker, I'm not going to trivialise uh, what happened. Uh, I, and I, I, and I, yes, Mr Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker, th th I'm not, because there's very serious complaints have been raised against uh, the member for Tamworth, and they're now being uh, investigated, Mr. Speaker. It is true. It is true that the com a complaint was uh, raised when he was in the Foreign Office, and the matter was uh, resolved. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true, Mr. Speaker, that it was ra raised with me. I greatly regret that he continued uh, in office, and, uh, and, I, and I've, I've said that. I have said that before, Mr. Speaker. I have said that. Uh, before, Mr. Speaker, but it is now it is now the subject of uh, an in independent investigation. Just watch that. No denial from Johnson of having joked about Pincher's predatory habits. So that's Britain, a country with a prime minister who hears that someone is sexually assaulting people, jokes about it, and then promotes that person into a position of responsibility over others. For his last two questions. Starmer was almost reading them from the writing on the wall. For a week, he's had them defending his decision to promote a sexual predator. Every day, the lines he's forced them to take have been untrue. Yeah. First, that he was unaware of any allegation. Untrue. Then, he was unaware of any specific allegation. Untrue. 
Then he was unaware of any serious specific allegation. <laughs> and now he wants them to go out and say that he simply forgot <laughs> that his whip was a sexual predator. Anyone with anything about them would be long gone from his front bench. Yeah. In the middle of a crisis, doesn't the country deserve better yes. than a Z-list cast of nodding doves? <laughs> it's exactly when, when times are tough and when the country faces pressures on uh, the economy uh, and pressures on their budgets, Mr. Speaker, and when we had the biggest war in Europe for 80 years, Mr. Speaker, uh, that, is when, that is exactly the moment that you'd expect a government uh, to continue with its work, not to walk away, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to get on with our job and to focus on the things that matter to the people of this country. And that, so we're not only cutting taxes uh, today, Mr. Speaker, we're putting £1,200 into every uh, one of the 8 million most vulnerable households in the country, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the strength of our economy economy and thanks to the decisions that we took, Mr Speaker, which he opposed at the time. The only thing he's delivering is chaos. Yes. I started this session with a quote from the young victim in all this, how he froze when he was attacked. When I was prosecuting rapists, I heard that from victims all the time. Victims said they froze because it's not about sex. It's about power. Yes. And the power the disgraced government minister had was handed to him by that prime minister. Yes. And he's only in power because he's been propped up for months by a corrupted party defending the indefensible. Yes. So it's no longer a case about swapping the person at the top. Isn't it clear? The only way the country can get the fresh start it deserves is by getting rid of a lot of them. The difference between this government and that opposition is we have a plan and they do not. We're, and we're getting on. They want to focus on this type of issue, Mr Speaker. We're going to get on with our jobs. We're going to control prices, Mr Speaker, by not giving in to the union barons. They're paid by the union barons and they're, and they're proud of it. Uh, we were the first European country to arm the Ukrainians, Mr Speaker. I'm proud of that. And those guys, Mr. Speaker, that the party opposite, the party opposite, not only do they want to put Corbyn, uh, Mr. Corbyn into number 10, uh, the member is into North, but eight of them, including the shadow foreign secretary, the shadow deputy leader, and, uh, uh, and six others, six others voted to get rid of our independent nuclear deterrent, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today we are cutting taxes, we're helping half a million people into work, and thanks to the strength of our economy, we're helping people up and down the country, and we are going to continue to deliver on the mandate I was given. An extraordinary Prime Minister's questions to watch because all the noise was on one side of the chamber. All the people sat behind Boris Johnson, his own MPs, were grimacing. And there is something slightly pleasurable about watching that kind of ruling class delusion. Some of us actually grew up watching it. That kind of ruling class delusion suddenly crack uh, in a moment of hubris when uh, Boris Johnson realizes that uh, uh, no one's with him and he isn't going to be king of the world after all. Tory backbenchers also went on the attack. Uh, and they didn't hold back. Does the Prime Minister think there are any circumstances in which he should resign? <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, in an attempt to boost morale in the tea room, the Prime Minister said uh, at a table, but there were seven people, MPs in the Carlton Club last week, and um, one of them should have tried to intervene to stop Chris from drinking so much, as if that wasn't insulting enough to the people who did try and intervene that night and then also to the victims that drink was the problem. Isn't it the example, Mr. Speaker, but it's the Prime Minister constantly tries to deflect from the issue, always tries to blame other people for mistakes, and that at least nothing um, left for him to do other than to take responsibility and resign. Whilst PMQs was taking place, another two junior ministers resigned from Johnson's government. And it was far from over in the Commons. Health Secretary Sajid Javid, former Health Secretary now, gave this statement. Effective governance inevitably requires loyalty and collective responsibility. Of course it does. And I'm instinctively a team player. And I have completely focused on governing effectively over the last year. But treading the tightrope between loyalty and integrity has become impossible in recent months. And Mr. Speaker, I will never risk losing my integrity. 
I also believe a team is as good as its team captain, and that a captain is as good as his or her team. So loyalty must go both ways. The events of recent months have made it increasingly difficult to be in that team. It's not fair on ministerial colleagues to go out every morning defending lines that don't stand up and don't hold up. Yeah. It's not fair on my parliamentary colleagues who bear the brunt of constituents' dismay in their inboxes and on their doorsteps in recent elections. Yeah. And it's not fair on conservative members and voters who rightly expect better standards from the party they supported. When the first stories of parties in Downing Street emerged late last year, I was personally assured at the most senior level by my right honourable friend's then team that, and I quote, there had been no parties in Downing Street and no rules were broken. So I gave the benefit of doubt. And I went on those media rounds to say that I'd had those assurances from the senior, most senior level of the Prime Minister's team. I welcome the Prime Minister's public acknowledgement last night that matters could have been handled better in who he appointed and what was said about what he knew when. And I appreciated his kind and humble words and the, his humble spirit when I went to see him yesterday and also the kind letter that he has sent to me. But I do fear that the reset button can only work so many times. There's only so many times you can turn that machine on and off before you realize that something is fundamentally wrong. Last month, I gave the benefit of doubt one last time. I have concluded that the problem starts at the top and I believe that is not going to change. And that means that it is for those of us in a position who have responsibility to make that change. Javed talked in his resignation speech about the bold plans he had for the NHS, how sad he was not to get to carry them out. Those plans included earlier this year uh, ordering the NHS to give hundreds of millions of pounds, almost 300 million pounds to private hospitals. Uh, we say good riddance. Just bear in mind, none of these people are resigning uh, because their consciences tell them to. They're resigning not because they've looked at their consciences. They're resigning because they've looked at the polls. They're resigning because they see that Boris Johnson isn't an election winner. They are all as selfish as he is. By 1 p.m., the resignation count stood at 18. And then over the next couple of hours, three more PPSs, that's assistance to ministers, and six more ministers resigned. Joining the calls for Johnson to go was former minister Liam Fox, who has staunchly supported Johnson throughout his premiership. I've loyally supported every conservative leader since 1992. However, today I am withdrawing my support for the prime minister. Boris Johnson's leadership is untenable. And then the first cabinet minister to pop up, secretary of state for leveling up, Michael Gove. He hasn't formally resigned, but the Daily Mail reported that Gove advised Johnson to quit while helping him to prepare for today's PMQs. Next, Johnson had to face MPs on the Liaison Select Committee, and it, was, uh, it made for viewing that was pleasurable and excruciating in equal measure. Could you just confirm, and I just appreciate a yes or a no, that you met with the former KGB officer, Alexandra Lebanov, uh, Lebedev, when you were Foreign Secretary without officials on the 28th of April 2018? Well, uh, I, I, I'd, have to, I, I'd have to check, but... Uh, wow. that's, Are you having that, a lapse of memory again? That, no, but that sounds... But, you know, if you're, you're asking me a very specific question about a very specific date, and I, really, I, 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 I would have to, to, I'd have to get back. I certainly have met the gentleman in question who's... Uh, who's without um, officials. Who, who used to be the proprietor of the London Evening Standard. I, when, I was... Uh, when I was mayor of London. So I, 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 I certainly am not going to deny having met uh, Alexander Lebedev. I, I certainly have. I as far as I remember, uh, he used to own uh, the London Evening Standard. Yes, but with uh, officials when you were foreign secretary. Did you meet with officials or without officials? Look, I, 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 I certainly met him without officials. Right. At a time of such economic crisis for the country, for many families up and down the country, that what the country needs is a government with the very best team, the very best fo focus, absolutely squarely focused on tackling these issues. And when you see Prime Minister, people like um, John Glenn leaving government, people like Kemi Badenoch, people like 
uh, Neil O'Brien, one of the intellectual architects of levelling up. Do you not feel, Prime Minister, the very ability, capacity of this government to, to address these enormous overhanging issues is, is, is deteriorating as we speak? Even more resignation since any Prime Minister since 1932. Michael Gove has told you to go. The shit adds up, the game's up, really. Will you be Prime Minister tomorrow? Uh, uh, of course, uh, Mr McNeil. Uh, but, uh, Next week? Uh, I'm, I'm, but I'm here to, uh, rather than giving any running commentary on uh, my own the rest uh, career, I'm here, to, all after Mr. I'm here to talk about what the government is doing. And okay. So for three months, Prime Minister, number 10, has had a recommendation just to look at this, because something has to fill the 4%. Okay. Have a working body to look at it. The Treasury signed off on it. And for three months, it's been sat in number 10. One week, I'm told, somebody's signed off on it. The next week, someone else has looked at it and actually has stopped it. And it's stuck. And my question is, the inertia inside number 10, perhaps because of the events that we'll go on to talk about, uh, is that nonsense. actually, we say it's nonsense, but actually it's a nonsense that we've been waiting three months sure. just for someone to sign off on something which fills 4% of the exchequer. I'd like to just read something out to you. Uh, quote, when a regime has been in power for too long, when it has fatally exhausted the patience of the people, and when oblivion finally beckons, I am afraid that across the world you can rely on the leaders of that regime to act solely in the interests of self-preservation and not in the interests of the electorate. Who authored that quote? Uh, uh, you, you're, you're, you're trying me. Was it, was it, uh... Was it uh, was it Cicero? Uh, was it uh, was it, Lord, was it Lord, Aristotle? Lord Farron. Was you, you, it, Prime Minister, you might it, like to think. Was it, was it, let me just think. Was, was I think it, you might be more like Plato. Uh, no, maybe uh, Nero. Uh, was, was it was Montesquieu? Maybe Nero. Uh, just to break it to you, was it was it? you, Prime Minister. Okay. And perhaps it was <laughs> okay. perhaps it was foresight okay. for okay. the well, uh, final week. Uh, now, can I just finish? Because I'm about to run out of time, Prime yeah. Minister. Okay. Because I, I made a joke there, but in all sincerity, and I know this must be difficult for you personally, but. This isn't funny. It's, it's not a game. People no, are struggling across the country. Not. I'm just finished. It's not brave for you to carry on doing this. I think, in my view, you're hurting the country, Prime Minister. Just on a very human level, surely yeah. you must know that it's in the country's interest for you to leave now. Which qualities in the former Deputy Chief Whip appealed to you most? You know, uh, I, 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 I think it was... Uh, so let me just do it. Big picture. No, uh, as I've, as I've said before, specific, I think I, picture, let me be let me be clear that I, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see that that appointment, as I said in the uh, in, in the house, and uh, I think I said on TV as well. I think that appointment was a was a mistake. Well, I want uh, to know about the qualities, was, it, it, qualities it, of the, ministers. The, the, so and the, if you had our government appointments based upon ability, uh, so it was it was put to me that uh, uh, that like uh, everyone we appoint. Uh, the, the member had excellent administrative skills. You have a 358 MPs. You did think it was 365. You have lost a few. As Mr Bryant has highlighted, you have now have 32 ministers and PPSs who've resigned. It was 28 at the beginning of this meeting. And, that, and then an additional uh, PPS who will resign tomorrow if you don't resign. So that makes it 182 if you include her. So half of 358, Prime Minister, just to make the math simple for you, yeah. is 179. It's not looking very good, is it? Well, you know, uh, May, you're, you're, you're wanting me to comment on uh, current... You've lost the confidence uh, of more than half to, you're of your party, not including other members current, through who may not be in the 148. On, on I've been generous and uh, not double counting. Well, sure. Uh, I, I'm here to talk about... Uh, the government of the country, the policies... But, Mr Prime Minister, uh, without the support you. of your party, you cannot govern this country but responsibly I've... or well. Whatever our political disagreements, I have respect for the office of Prime Minister, but I'm afraid I've completely lost respect for you and your capability to well, run this I, I, I... Ambition, could that not be considered delusion at times? Yeah, that, that's a sort of uh, a, a moral judgment about hu human nature that you know, I, I wouldn't venture to, to, to comment on. I think that okay. uh, we, maybe we're all deluded in our, our, our ambitions, but I think most people who come to this place actually, in spite of what everybody says about MPs, are actuated by the highest motives. I agree. And most people want to serve their constituents and get stuff done. Yes. And, and, that is, and that is the reality. Commitment to service and nothing else. If you believe that coming from this man, from Boris Johnson, you'll believe anything. In that excruciating clip, you saw Tory MP Hugh Merriman grilling Johnson. Well, he pulled quite the trick because he tweeted out his resignation letter in the middle of that committee while sitting right in front of the prime minister. One of the most amusing things that happened during the select committee was this. It's being reported that there's a 
delegation of your cabinet colleagues waiting in Downing Street, including the chief whip, the transport secretary and your new chancellor, waiting to tell you when you finish here today that it's time for you to go. How will you respond to that? Uh, uh, Darren, Darren you're, you're asking me to comment uh, on... This conversation uh, will it, happen in a few minutes, Prime Minister. So you say, uh, but I, I, if you want to ask about uh, what we're doing to help people uh, with the cost of living, if you are, want to ask about what we're doing to build more clean, green energy supply, which uh, this, this committee has taken uh, an interest in... That's going to be your you, answer to the Cabinet colleagues then, in Downing Street. Then, then I, I'm very happy to, to talk to you about it, but I'm not going to give a, a running commentary on political events, uh, we're going to get on with the government of the country. That was Labour MP Darren Jones there, revealing Johnson's fate to him in real time, who had no idea of what was awaiting him. It's perfect for all Johnson's classical metaphors. He truly is like the emperor living in his palace, talking about his aggressive plans to build and, and, and create everywhere, while all around him things burn and people try to kick him out. Um, while he was in the committee, more resignations occurred as Johnson was sat there talking about his ambitious plans, including the Minister for Equalities, Mike Freer, who said the government is creating an atmosphere of hostility to LGBT people. That's true, they won't ban trans conversion therapy, for example. I don't know why it took Mike Freer so long to decide that. Also during the committee, it emerged that Tory whips had reported that no, absolutely zero MPs were prepared to fill empty ministerial posts so that we now have a government uh, without ministers in key posts and it can't fill those posts. Let's jump now to that delegation. A gang of cabinet ministers arrived at number 10 to tell Johnson to go. They included Grant Shapps, Brandon Lewis, Simon Hart, and Kwasi Kwarteng, and possibly Nadim Zahawi, though, as I mentioned, we don't know which of the two rival delegations Nadim Zahawi was in, the one telling Johnson to go or telling him to stay. At the same time as that was happening, it emerged that the influential 1922 committee of Tory backbenchers had voted not to change the rules for triggering a confidence vote. Under the current rules, Johnson can't face another confidence vote for almost a year. And the fact that the 1922 committee won't change the rules despite today's event uh, uh, shows, uh, suggests that they might think there's an easier way to get rid of him. But even if they're wrong, uh, new members of the committee will be elected next week, and many of those running have pledged to change the rules if need be. We're now, at the time of this broadcast, up to 38 MPs who have resigned from Boris Johnson's government. And if you add that to the 148 MPs who voted against him in the vote of no confidence a few weeks ago, if you assume that all the people actually in his government voted for him, 40 MPs almost have now uh, resigned from his government, add that to the people who voted against him a few weeks ago, it's hard to see how Johnson can possibly survive, how he has really any support left. And we've just had reports, if you think there's someone who will always be there supporting Boris Johnson, reports now that Priti Patel, the uh, uh, deluded, terrifying, semi-fascist Boris Johnson elevated to the Home Office, um, has now called on him to go. Um, so really, as we're here tonight, my first question for Dahlia and Aaron, uh, Dahlia, I'll start with you. How long do you think Boris Johnson's got? Do you think he'll make it through the rest of the night? I mean, I do think that that, that Patel resignation is... Not, not a, a resignation. Real, that we don't that have, is a shift. Because I should say, we don't have a resignation yet. Uh, uh, we, we just have her apparently calling on Boris Johnson to go. Oh, okay. The, the, him losing the backing of Patel, let's say, um, that is a that is a key shift because Boris Johnson is single handedly uh, responsible for rehabilitating Priti Patel's uh, career. Let's not forget she was uh, disgraced for having quote unquote freelance foreign policy meetings uh, with members of the Israeli state that were undeclared and are therefore very I'm pretty sure are illegal. I'm not entirely sure if it does. Our law allows for lots of very shady things to happen, so it might not be quite illegal, but at least highly inappropriate uh, for for someone in a in a ministerial position uh, to have. So the fact that she is breaking ranks uh, with Boris Johnson, particularly because Boris Johnson does kind of sit to an extent, particularly when it comes to to racism and immigration, um, you know, it does sit within her kind of wing of the party. Uh, so that is an, an incredibly momentous uh, uh, piece of news, I would say. I think that, you know, you said it earlier on the show, and I think that that this is right. I think that Boris Johnson 
is very much not one to resign from things. Uh, we know even under when Michael Howard was was leader of the Tory party, he refused to resign from a minister, from a cabinet position uh, because he um, after uh, details of an affair came out. Uh, so he is very much, you know, not one who wants to to resign um, from positions. He's not one. He wants to leave on his own terms. But I think the fact that a snap election simply cannot happen under these conditions because it's not just about call, calling snap election. It's about having ministers and, you know, party members that are willing to go on the media, that are willing to canvas, that are willing to put in the work behind a campaign um, to try and get you elected. And that clearly uh, cannot happen now. So I think what we are like most likely to see uh, is probably the 1922 committee uh, changing the rules when they next meet, which I believe is next week, um, in order for them to implement another no confidence vote in Boris Johnson, which I obviously expect um, he will lose. Something in my gut tells me that he still won't leave of his own accord. Um, but clearly, um, the Conservative Party are willing to do literally whatever it takes um, in order to 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 get rid of rid of him, and that that Patel um, loss of confidence. Uh, signifies a real shift. I think it might only be Nadine Doris. She might be the only one left with her white flag, you know, on the sinking ship. Um, as a, as a, I think she would back him even after he stops backing himself, which is really saying something. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that his days are absolutely numbered. Um, that, that is for sure. It is striking, though, that another politician, Priti Patel, someone who salivates, I think, at the sight of refugees drowning, uh, someone who's pushed legislation to remove Roma people's ability to even live their lives in any kind of traditional way uh, and attack the right to protest and so on. It's striking that even she now thinks that she'll be better off without Boris Johnson's backing. It seems like if MPs moving against Jeremy Corbyn back in 2016 rushed to tell everyone that this was all personal and they agreed with all the policies when they didn't really. Now you've got MPs moving against Boris Johnson saying, uh, we've disagreed with these policies for a long time. Uh, Mike Freer saying the government's uh, uh, creating an unsafe atmosphere for LGBT people. But really, it's just all personal. And they don't have any kind of different uh, policy uh, proposal. And, and, and that's why uh, it took them so long to move against Boris Johnson. They only did when the polling went so bad. Uh, Aaron, what's your prognosis to give you a kind of hostage to fortune as well, since Dahlia's done one? Uh, do you think Boris will last the night? If you were to weigh things up, you'd look at the 1922 committee. They've decided, you know, that he he stays. Nothing nothing changes in terms of the rules. And another um, motion of no confidence. Of course, you're meant to have one of those only once every 12 months. The rules need to be changed in order to do, do that again. There was one, I think, what was it? It was June. It was early June, I think, the last motion of no confidence. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, and so you have new elections. The executive of the 1922 committee on Monday... And that will probably be won, I presume. That seems to be the, the consensus. That will be won by people who want to change the rules for another motion no confidence, at which point there'll be a motion no confidence, at which point he has to go. You wonder, before it gets that far, Boris Johnson hasn't really got much leverage now. And I think Dahlia is right. He's obviously going to go. What he does still have the power to do, perhaps, is go under his own terms. He'd say, I will resign at the end of next week. He wants to avoid looking like Margaret Thatcher being dragged out of 10 Downing Street just as she was in 1990 um, and, and to perhaps be closer to Blair uh, or um, Theresa May than a, a Cameron or a Gordon Brown. You know, they're sort of being dragged out, people calling them squatters, uh, which he effectively is at this point. You know, Boris Johnson is a squatter at number 10 Downing Street. Uh, so I think that probably should be what he's thinking about and where his brain should be. But I suspect it isn't because the man, as was talked about in that brilliant committee meeting with uh, Darren Jones and some other people, I don't really like Darren Jones, Labour MP in, um, in the Southwest, Bristol, but it was a brilliant few questions he asked. I don't know if people noticed this, but Boris Johnson did a remarkable thing turning up to that um, committee meeting. He did his hair, which really goes to show... Uh, we are seeing pigs fly right now in terms of in terms of the politics of of all of this. So I think he'll probably go after Monday. If he had any sense, he would tell the country and his colleagues he's going before then, 
and play for time and a sort of favorable timeline and good optics. So he's not remembered as a complete disaster, which of course I think is priced in already, to be quite frank. Finally, I I see a lot of people saying, well, Trump held on and, you know, he was quite close to winning in, in 2020 or everybody doubted Trump in 2016 and he won. The consensus was that Corbyn was useless in 2016 and yet he takes away the Tories' uh, majority in, in 2017. Last year, people were saying that Keir Starmer was a dead duck with terrible local election results, terrible by-election result barely winning in Batley and Spen. Good to remember that if Labour had lost that, he probably would have gone. Yet he's turned it around. Why can't Boris Johnson? And I think that's really misreading the gravity of the situation right now. Until this week, and it's why I didn't think Boris Johnson was going to go anywhere, until this week, a majority of both Conservative Party members and 2019 Conservative Party voters Back to Boris Johnson. A majority of 2019 voters for the Tory party wants him to go nowhere. So I thought really... Everything else is broadly irrelevant. If the donors are backing him and the people that voted the Tories in at the last time of asking are backing him, uh, this, is all, this is all talk and speculation. And of course, the lobby and Westminster, they love speculation, particularly around who's coming in, who's going out, because it puts them at the centre of our national politics and not the electorate, as it should be. There was a huge element of that, and I agreed with that argument. This has now changed. In the last 72 hours, we're seeing multiple polls showing a decisive majority of Tory voters want him out. That in no way resembles Trump in 2016 or Trump in 2020 or you know Jeremy Corbyn in, in, in 2016, 2017. In each instance, a majority of Republican voters or a majority of uh, uh, Labour voters, Labour members, wanted those people to stay. So this is new levels of delusion. And Beware of a recency bias. Well, so-and-so did this two years ago, and they got away with it. Why can't Boris Johnson? Very different, very unique set of circumstances. Well, the bunker is closing. Nadine Doris has come out of Downing Street and said that she still backs Boris Johnson. Uh, is even Pretty Patel, uh, uh, that, that woman who salivates at the thought of drowning refugees, uh, it thinks that it's time for Boris to be drowned too. Um, it, actually, for, on ITV, uh, we have Anushka Stana reporting that Johnson is defiant. So reports that he really is holding up in that bunker. I've been Barnaby Rain, standing in for Michael Walker, who's ill, so we wish him better. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navara Media. Good night.